that the Baden vigilantes use. That's just this year. But if you want to look further ahead, they start to use other measures and they look at other things. And that's what Dave has been pointing out is the deterioration in terms of terms of finance. And the deterioration in terms of finance, I think, so far it has not happened. Actually, the terms of finance got easier. <laughs> Last year they got harder, but ultimately they will get harder. <laughs> Um, so basically, the bond vigilantes are back. They're looking at contagion. That's what the first article is that I read. Um, we're getting contagion from Greece. Namely, that's why you're all here tonight, because you've been alerted to. And all we, every day we pick up the newspaper, and the front page of, of the weekend newspaper is the, the, the usual daily riot in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> it's front page. <laughs> it's no longer... You know, it's no longer subliminal. It is now screaming in our face. So the bond vigilantes see this. They see contagion taking place. And basically what starts to happen is the terms of finance start to dissolve. And by that, what I mean is the following. Um, what starts to happen is you buy less of the stuff if you really think they're risky, which is what has happened in, 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 in the pig belt of, uh, of Europe. And the price goes down, and the yield goes up, and the impact of being considered to be more risky, it becomes all that more difficult to roll over the debt because the terms are harder. And in the first, second article I, I, I had you read as an introduction, uh, he was talking about how our, 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 our debt carry will go from 200 billion to 700 billion. Now, what's pushing the yields up are a number of things. It's not just the perception of sovereign risk, but the other thing that pushes the yields up is one of the ways the market manifests this concern is just to get out of the United States market. You get out of the dollar, you get out of treasuries, and you go somewhere else. Now, that sets off a big, major chain reaction. When you have capital flight, it is all-encompassing. It it's the most major thing that virtually can happen to an economy. What, ha what happens is if you, if you have net capital flight because you're afraid of the treasuries, and since everything is priced relative to treasuries, and if treasury yields will go up, corporate yields will go up, which means the prices will go down. And I don't want to be in an economy that is being stressed where it's likely that the central bank will be called upon to, to inflate the, the money supply, and there's, there's sovereign risk possibilities. It's all bad news. So basically, you flee the country. And they just did it in Europe. I mean, you know, it's nothing new. They did it in the United States a year ago. So you start to flee the dollar, and you start to flee the treasuries. And then what starts to happen is a chain reaction. And the bigger chain reaction of all that is um, at least a stagflation is what happens. Uh, <clears throat> capital leaves the country. Uh, and to leave the country, you've got to sell the stocks and bonds. Those prices fall. The yields rise because you want to get out of the country, number one. Number two, uh, the currency falls. And the result of the currency falling means that when we buy foreign products from that country, they're now more expensive. So if the capital flees to China, don't expect to buy t-shirts for, for 10 bucks anymore. They're going to be $30 or $20. Basically, we're going to start paying higher prices on textiles and everything else they manufacture, which is almost everything. So basically, uh, what then happens is you set off something called imp imported inflation as a result of capital flight. So you have this chain reaction. You, you sell the stocks and bonds. The prices go down. Wealth diminishes. The interest carry goes up. Capital flees. Foreign products become more expensive. Well, you put all that together with something called stagflation. That's the formula for stagflation. Stagflation means the economy goes into a recession with inflation. And capital flight is the formula. Uh, back in... 1997, when capital fled uh, the Asian tigers, or in 1995, when it fled Mexico, uh, the Mexican, I'll give you some benchmarks. So I was teaching the course at the time, and Mauricio, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my recollection is the SETA, which is what, the short-term treasury? The SETA was 10% or 11%. Inside of two weeks, it was 70%. 7-0. 7 <laughs> From 1.0 to 7.0 is my recollection about two weeks later, and I think it even got higher subsequently. In other words, you sell the currency and get out. Furthermore, the peso falls, 
And then the price of the dollar to the Mexicans increase, and to the extent they're buying U.S. products that are not made in Mexico, they have to pay so much more in pesos to buy the dollars, to buy the American products that they don't produce. It could have been drugs, it could have been, I mean, pharmaceuticals, or it could be, you know, anything that they don't produce, which I'm sure is a lot of things. Um, the inflation rate gets up to 70% from 10. That's my recollection. It gets to 70%. This is 1995, so that's, um, that's uh, 15 years ago. Almost instantaneously, the treasury, short-term treasury rate goes from 10 to 70, and the inflation rate goes to 70. Same thing happens with the Asian tigers. Now, of course, in those cases, foreign capital was a bigger percentage of the capital holdings of, of, of the financial market, and, and the markets were not as broad as ours. However, do not forget the fact that the U.S. is a net debtor nation. As being the reserve currency, we got so much foreign investment here. In fact, we're six trillion uh, net debtor nation. So there's a hell of a lot of foreign investment in the United States. So basically, if you start to have a flight to capital, the end result of it is the yields rise dramatically, the price of foreign-made products it rise so dramatically, you end up with import inflation, you end up with very high interest rates and inflation, and the high interest rates that do two things. You know, when the capital leaves, the stock and bond prices fall, so there's a wealth effect, so you don't consume as much because you've lost wealth. That's number one. And number two, the cost of capital to any business has suddenly gone from 15% to 80%. Well, now you have across the board defaults. Furthermore, think of the banks. Uh, the banks in that country were holding these securities. And now these securities are crushed down so they don't make capital requirements, so the banks are no longer rolling over notes. So you have cross-country default take place. And then the default yields rise. This is the, the pattern of capital flight. And it happened so dramatically in Mexico. It happened so dramatically in all the Asian tigers. And, and if, it, if it hits you hard, basically, you go through what's called austerity. You go through a period of time, and it's usually about six years. And there's no magic number about six years, but let me tell you what, what, what has to happen. You, you know, with, with interest rates of 70 for the Treasury, you can imagine what a corporation's paying. Well, if, if you even get to be able to roll over the debt, how can a company go from paying 15% on its debt to 80% on its debt and still have a business plan that works? Or, how, or did they have any ability to refinance their debt when all the banks are under? Are under? That's exactly what happens. So you have nationwide bankruptcy. Then the question happens when we have nationwide bankruptcy, what happens from there? Well, basically, <clears throat> you get a, you get, it's like going to the post office. You get in line and take a ticket at the bankruptcy court. Probably takes you six, eight years to, 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 to adjudicate all the bankruptcies that take place. The only thing that short circuits all that, and what, what's happening when all these companies are waiting to go through bankruptcy? Well, the companies are, are, are closed down. At best, they have a security force to, to protect the physical structures, at best. Actually, a very curious thing would happen. Some of the employees would come back and guard the, the, the plant. And, and the reason they were guarding it, because they were hoping a foreign investor would come and, and buy the plant out of bankruptcy at pennies on the dollar, and at least they would have a plant to go back to work if they ever were, were <coughs> re recapitalized. So basically, the employees became a security force, uh, which is really kind of curious and interesting. Um, basically, where do, they, where do they, what do people do? They go to agriculture. They go back to farming. Iceland, Iceland today. Uh, when Iceland went upside down with capital flight, um, they asked the premier, uh, the people said, what can we do? He said, we gotta go back to farming and fishing. Of course, he, uh, at the election the next week, he was, he was thrown out, but basically, <laughs> <laughs> basically he told the truth. <laughs> that will do it every time. <laughs> you go back to farming and fishing. It was really kind of interesting. That week in the Austin Statesman on the front page, uh, there was a story on the community gardens that were taking place somewhere downtown. And I, I thought maybe it's happening here as well. We're going back to agriculture. But the thing that really crushes you is when the bond vigilantes get around, and, and, and it's not even forcing a default, it's just leaving the country. And that's what happens to the country when they leave the country. And ultimately, uh, what happens, the cycle is, uh, the interest rates rise, 
the co uh, cost of capital goes to beyond anything that anyone can afford. The banks go out. Everyone has to get recapitalized and start again. Now, there is a short, so, uh, you don't have to wait six years. And I say six years because that's the question is how many bankruptcy judges and courts do you have? Um, I think one of the countries, and I haven't been able, subsequently I've been trying to look this up, and I haven't been able to, but one of the countries, in, in being quite wise about it, realized that you had countrywide bankruptcies. So basically what they did was institute a national cram down of debt and a national bankruptcy instead of each company, company by company, going to the bankruptcy court to get your debt crammed down. They crammed down all debt, like 90%. And then basically they put them back in business much more quickly. Uh, and that's what we would have to do. And basically, that's what we ought to be doing in the United States with the residential mortgage-backed securities, or the, excuse me, that, the mortgages, the mortgages that are part of the residential mortgage-backed securities. They ought to be crammed down so we can get out of that problem. So national cram down did short circuit the process, but usually it's about a six or eight year process of how long it takes for a national bankruptcy to take place. By the way, the latest candidate, uh, the last one of the emerging nations that went upside down and had capital flight was Turkey. I mean, the, the sequence was Mexico was the first to grow, the first one to fall apart in 95, followed by the Asian Tigers in 97, then Brazil and Argentina, I think 98, 99. I think Turkey fell in 2000. Well, this is 2010. Turkey's making a huge comeback. In fact, that's probably one of the best places to go right now. The reason being is when you go through the national bankruptcy process, you can buy the capital assets 10 cents on the dollar. Labor just got cheaper because they're sitting there unemployed and, and otherwise farming. And third of all, the currency has been crushed down because the capital flight crushed the value of the currency. So with outside capital, they rebuild these countries and take over the companies and start to, to go again. So it, it's a phenomenal opportunity if you see it happen. And as I say, Turkey is in kind of a, a late stage of turnaround. I think the opportunity in Turkey when they hit bottom, I think it was two years ago. And, and they've been one of the persistent growers in the world right now. Because you start off with a base of 10 cents on the dollar for both labor and capital and the currency. So basically, that could happen. It could happen to us. I think we were well on our way in 2009. And then the only thing that stopped us is things got worse in Eastern Europe, and now the capital's flowing back here. As far as I'm concerned, we got we to gotta reprieve. We got to reprieve. The question is to take advantage of the reprieve, and if so, where to go with it. So, um, <clears throat> so what stops a company, country is the terms, the terms of, uh, the terms of uh, trade. Interest rates rise, you want to look at it analytically because of default risk, because of sovereign risk, because of inflation risk. If you want to be academic about why all those premiums exist. But that's, that is the sum total of all the, you know, that's how the SATA went from 10% went from to 70%. Uh, all, those, all those premiums. So basically, uh, the market stops you. And are we on the way for the market stopping us yet? Well, I think the bond vigilantes started stopping us last year. If you remember, June of last year, Bernanke had to announce Fed exit to get rid of the inflation fears. So the foreigners wouldn't flee because of the anticipation that the Fed would have to um, incur inflation to try to get the economy uh, back on, on a solid footing. So basically, that, that's critical. The other way the market stops you, if they don't stop you with capital flight, which is very effective, they just stop you the way the UK was stopped last spring. Uh, you, go to, you go to the um, auction, this is, this is the way the uh, government bond, uh, how the government finances itself. Uh, one day a week, usually on Monday, they do short-term finance, and Wednesday they do long-term finance. And basically, it is a, an auction. And you, you announce to the, to the market you're gonna auction off $10 billion that day, and you ask for sealed bids, and the government accepts the, the cheapest 10 billion, and everyone gets the rate of the marginal person who bid uh, to, to make a cumul cumulative amount of 10 billion. So basically, uh, the UK went to uh, the auction last spring, and I don't know what the number was, they were auctioning off 10 and whatever, and there was only five bid bids accumulated under any terms, up to five, and basically you have a failed auction. And I don't know what the terms of the auction are. I would think it's a failed auction and no one gets, I think, um, my guess is that you, no one, they don't accept any of the bids. Um, so basically, you now have to go back 
Uh, and what did it do immediately, by the way? The rating agencies immediately downgraded, put UK under warning, and about two weeks later downgraded them. So basically, the market could stop you one way or the other. They just don't stop buying at the original issue market, or they, or they just 